everyone. Welcome to the Lung Cancer Living Room. Thank you all for being here, those of you in the room and those of you joining us online tonight. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're excited about tonight. You guys have heard us over the last several months, if not a better part of a year, talk about patient registries and the registry we, we, we've been building and that we built and that we launched. And uh, tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about why it's important um, what registries are, how they work, um, um, what can come out of them, and how it can directly affect um, discovery in, the, in this space, how, how your information um, can have impact and, ha and how important it is. So uh, we're excited to have you all here tonight. I'm gonna give a little demo. I know most of you in the room and, and probably most of you online have, have already signed up for the registry, but if you haven't, my great hope by the end of the night um, is that you will go to lungcancerregistry.org and, uh, and fill out your profile. So with that being said, we're going to um, do things a, a little bit differently tonight. Um, we're gonna save the around the room um, and, and do that more towards the end. And, and we're actually gonna open before we go into the presentation with a video. Um, uh, Jennifer, as most of you know, I don't, I don't know where she is, but she worked really hard um, for our, our planning meeting that we just had recently at creating uh, a video, and it's a thank you video, and, and the video, you know, on, in this instance is, is a thank you to my mom um, for putting together this foundation and really, you know, developing and creating an, uh, this amazing team of people who are literally, quite literally, working 24-7 um, advocating and, and fighting for change in this space. So we created this video and, and, and I wanna show it, um, uh, show it um, so that you guys can all see it. Some of you may have already seen it um, um, and, and we're gonna show it. Are you ready? <laughs> if I can, I'm, I'm keeping my, you guys all know because you've heard me say this time and time again that I'm technically challenged. So I promise I'm gonna try my best to ensure that this works exactly how I uh, you know, want it to. Oh, I'd be brave if you're brave I'd be brave, but only if you're brave Yeah, we can both be here Bonnie is courageous, um, and what she's done after her illness has been hopefully cured. And she's picked up the pieces, and she's moved forward, uh, and she's now helping everybody else. The first time I saw Bonnie was, it's instant click. It's just like we have known each other for years. This friend and this role model and it's my, like my hero. I would have to hug and tell her how much I love her and thank her. Just what she started that is now worldwide, just started as a dream. She will always be special to me. She is a angel. She saw an injustice and she wanted to do something about it. She is the one who drives all of us to do what we do every day. She's definitely a fighter, that's for sure. I am beyond proud of my mom, not just in what she's been able to accomplish, but in the woman she is as a mom and a friend. Showing everybody how to be brave and how to keep going, smiling, and not take no for an answer. I think she sets the tone for the whole organization. Her whole heart is into it. Every patient she speaks to, every employee she speaks to around here, they're always the most important person in the room. She just has so much energy, so much passion. So much life, this zest. Bonnie's a game changer. She turned to medicine, science, and research and said, we are gonna be part of the solution. Bonnie understands lung cancer. She probably knows more than many of the MD, PhDs I've worked with. Bonnie Adario has horsepower. I mean, she's been able to open doors for cancer patients that wouldn't have otherwise been opened. Bonnie is the iron hand in the velvet glove. You always feel like uh, you're being treated with respect whilst you're being pushed forward to excel and do whatever you want to do. She has such a powerful presence in, in such a positive way. She treats anyone that walks through this door like family. We all have a part in this fight towards feeding lung cancer. Bonnie has really helped our patients kind of embrace that they too are inspirations to help one another. I believe. Coming from having taken care of my mom who had lung cancer, walking in and feeling the hope. I mean, I felt it right when I met her. Bonnie, the champion, Bonnie, the patient advocate, Bonnie, the hugger. From day one, it was hugs. So 
I knew I was home. She just like embraced me the first time I met her. From the beginning, she said, you are a lung cancer survivor. I believe it, you're gonna be okay, but you need to believe it. And that was like the first time that someone had really said that. So that was one of the best messages. What she does is bring a focus every day to us and reminding us that we cannot wait. We have to drive this forward. Bonnie likes to talk about there being no I in team. Though while there's no I in team, there's certainly I in inspiration. And Bonnie is that. Her goal was to save one life from lung cancer. And since then, she has made so many countless people's lives better, including mine. It's just so important to bring hope to people with this disease and hopefully uh, eventually a cure. And I believe that she's the one that's gonna, gonna get it done. I love you, babe. You've done an incredible job. And we're with you every step of the way. So I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. So, um, great video, right? And so I think, are you crying now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, this was our way of, like I said in the beginning, of, of thanking her and some of the patients that... So what can I oh, say boy, about sorry. Bonnie oh, and Oh boy, oh, sorry, it. see, I Stop told you, Stop I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, um, it, was, it was our way of, um, of thanking her and, like I said, the, if we could have interviewed every patient and included them in a video, we would have, um, um, but the patient's way. And, and um, as much as I'd like to tell you that this video is the beginning of the end, or the beginning and the end of this um, uh, portion of what I'm about to say, it's not, because there actually is an ask of all of you. I know that um, each and every person in the room has someone to thank. So what we'd really appreciate is if you guys here in the room and those of you at home watching live and those of you that are gonna come back and watch later, um, take a video um, with the person you're grateful for um, and or by yourself just thanking the people in your life who have, have, have made this journey a little bit easier. Um, we we want to put together um, this really great sort of compilation of, of thank yous. So this was our thank you to you. Um, I don't know who you're thankful for, but maybe you could make a video too. Well, you know, I just, I just want to make one comment about that video. This is the second time I saw it, and I cried through the first one, and the second one, I'll probably cry through it. Mostly because some of those people are not with us anymore. The first one on the video was my oncologist. And after he took such amazing care of me, um, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. So the message is, anyone can get this disease. And that's when we're thanking and we're doing our thank you videos to everybody that we want to thank. Don't forget to mention that. You don't, you don't have to smoke. You can be an oncologist and get lung cancer. I became his caretaker. And it was one of the, one of the um, things I'm most proud of. So it's, yeah, it, yeah it's um, um, the thank goes out from me uh, to all of you, the patients, the caregivers, the people that work at this foundation, the doctors, the researchers, the industry partners, everybody who, who has a place and a, and a stake in this game in, in changing not only the face of lung cancer, but how it's treated um, and really developing these new novel treatments and therapies that um, can help us kick this disease right in the rear. We, we, we do what we do because all of you make it possible for us to do what we do. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I think it's a perfect segue into the registry and what very important piece, re this registry and registries like it will play in, in helping to, um, to, to move the needle forward in this place. So um, with that, I want to introduce you all to Kyle Brown with Invite um, Genome Network. Previously, um, you guys have heard me talk in the past about patient crossroads, patient crossroads, patient crossroads. Um, um, so they were who we had originally worked with and they've since uh, uh, merged and they are now in Vitae. Um, so Kyle, thank you for coming. Sure, thank you. You're, um, you're very welcome. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself and before we jump into the registry and sort of how you got into this space, where you think it's going, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, so, so I got into this space um, actually through a woman I met named Pat Furlong, who reminds me a lot of Bonnie. Uh, oh. and, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I, I really got into this because of the patients and the patient advocacy foundations. It wasn't about research or building a business or anything like that. It was, I, I met Pat Furlong, and she um, worked with, um, or she had two boys that both had muscular dystrophy. Two, two boys, can you imagine, right? Mm. And she was a nurse, and she would go to the doctors, say, you know, look, I have some... The, you know, knowledge about what's going on because I've taken care of not one boy with muscular dystrophy, but two. And I understand the, the genetic components of this. I understand the medical components of this. So she went to various different, you know, foundations and, and researchers, and she was kind of dismissed as, you know, a hysterical parent, right? Um, and that just bothered me, you know. It's... You live with this. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you're making me cry. <laughs> I'll just cry. <laughs> it's true. But, um, but it's tough, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it, it just struck me that, you know, I'm an internet guy. I'm a technology guy. And I started just thinking about what she wanted me to do, which was put together what she called a patient registry. And I came from the research space. I understood pharmaceuticals and how to discover drugs and such. And I thought... Well, that's interesting. And the more we started talking about it, I realized patients are at the center of this whole ecosystem, if you will. And how can you possibly think you're going to cure 10,000 diseases, right, if you don't talk to patients and you don't understand what their journey is and you don't understand what they're going through? Uh, so I got into it through, you know, people just like you, uh, just trying to help and seeing if, if using the Internet and putting this data into one big place, we could just start asking common sense questions that your doctors aren't gonna ask you. You know, I think what's the, the normal time with the doctor now is like seven minutes, right? And what's he do the whole time you're, you're in a, the, the you know, consultation? He's typing on his computer. Well, why, why not just send you home and say, hey, go to this website and Take a couple surveys and tell us about your disease. And so kind of in a nutshell, that's all we're trying to do here is can we get more people to come to the program? We now call them patient insights networks. And we can talk about, you know, the, the registry term. But it is about patient insights. And if you do have a URL and you can go and contribute your information on a regular basis, if enough people do that, you just start identifying patterns, right? Um, Bonnie and I were talking, you, you know, be, be, before this, that it's just kind of common sense. And, you, you know, like Bonnie said, maybe it's people with blue eyes, right? And maybe your blood type makes a difference. Who knows? Um, but unless you ask the non-obvious questions, you're not going to get the non-obvious answer. And if, and if it was an obvious answer, we'd have discovered a cure. Right. You know, to your point, there was a fellow in the, in the video, and he is still with us today. His name is Wells, and I think he's going on 20 years surviving lung cancer at stage four. And his, his um, treatment program was ERESA, which was taken off the market at some point in time and in, in the United States, and then recently just put back. But he received it in the mail constantly because he was surviving on it, and it was originally in a clinical trial. But we always joke with him that his treatment program was ERESA. He was also on a drug called Celebrex, which is an anti-inflammatory, and Maker's Mark. <laughs> so we actually gave him, we actually surprised him at the gala this year and gave him a bottle of Maker's Mark. But um, the point was, could it be that that Celebrex because it's an anti-inflammatory, had some. So, and could it be that we create this registry and after we collect data from thousands of patients, start seeing commonalities across the board amongst the patients on other, other drugs they're taking that could be maybe for diabetes or, or some other thing. So more data, not just about what drugs you're on for your cancer, right. But what, where you were born, not where you live, we don't care where you live, where, what is your ancestry? What's your ethnicity? You know, 
on and on and on. So we want to get as much information as we can. So we start seeing really things that can unlock the code. Yeah. And I, I think too. You, you've been talking about this for years that the, you know, the cure to cancer and the answer, and not just lung, but across the board, lies within the patient, right? And it, on, on varying levels, you know, we, we talk a lot here about genomics and, and right. the, the, the DNA and circulating tumor cells and all kinds of crazy stuff, right? But it's that combined with some of this insight data mm -hmm. um, right. where there's the potential to, to, right. to find patterns. So Kyle, talk to me a little bit about, you know, registries historically, patient insights, the different types that are out there. Sure. And go ahead. Sure. So, so when you know we started doing this, I, I think it's almost twelve years ago now. Um, and when we first started, you know, again back to Pat, right? And I, I'm a, a technology guy. I'm not a healthcare. You know, I'm not a doctor. Why do I know? But I would go to some of these conferences and speak at the conferences about the power of collecting this data and and sharing it. Um, and, and be able to make it available. Because you know, collecting data and keeping it all to yourself, you know, we'll, we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. But, right. but <laughs> you know, if you're going to collect this magnitude of data, you need to make it available to anybody that, that really needs this information. So I would talk about that. And, and you know, the fact that patients have something to say and we should share this data. And you know, people thought I was nuts um, because they came from, you know, they're res researchers, right? And you know, I'm not blaming them, it's the system. But, okay. but the, it's about clinician-entered data. And you know, the doctor is the most important person in the room. I would argue the patient's the most important person in the room. Um, so, so historically, registries were, were clinician-entered, physician-entered. Sometimes you'd have pharmaceutical companies set them up. And there's a couple of pharmaceutical companies, you know, they're really famous for doing those. But they don't necessarily share that information, which which really restricts access and makes it more more difficult. Right. Um, so so there's physician led registries or researcher led registries. Um, there's also clinical trial and and product registries that are generally done by pharmaceutical companies. More and more, we're seeing a blend, um, and these are and and I think where where we kind of made made our name was combining the genetics with the patient reported information. Um, because you do need some level of the clinical insights. Sure, of course. But you need them both. Right. Right. It's not a it's not a all or nothing thing. It's we need them both. Right. Um, so so that was why you know I, I joke I keep changing the name of the company right. right. <laughs> so so that's that's why we were excited to, to join with Invite which does genetic testing, right? Because now we have the patient side of the house. We can collect clinical data and we can get the genetic information. Right. So, you know, my mantra is always more data. Right. Um, and, and put it in one place and make it accessible and that's how we're gonna make, make progress. Absolutely. And, and it's gonna be driven by patients. No doubt. They're in charge. They're entering the data. Yep. And it will also go to their um, electronic medical records mm -hmm. and pull out scans and screens and things. So. When you're traveling and you're anywhere in the world and you need help, you're going to have access to your data in seconds. The physician in the ER room can get to your data with your permission, mm -hmm. of course. Um, so it's, it's huge. Yeah. It's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, with kind of going along the lines of that, you know, one of the concerns, and Kyle, you can probably speak to this, historically was, you know, from some of the naysayers as well, how reliable is patient reported? Yeah you know, data, you know, yeah. do they really understand what they're inputting? Do they really, can you really use that to move forward, you know, and, and, and find value? What yeah. do you say to that? Well, I would say for sure there's value in, in what the patient has to say. It depends on what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to ask them, you know, what's, do you have a skip, what exon, do you have a skip in your mutation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably they're not going to be able to tell you that. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them, how far do you drive to the doctor? What doctors do you see? Um, you, you know, what's, what, how do you feel? You know, that's the thing that's always kind of stuck with me is a, a doctor can't tell you how you feel. Mm 
Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, that that's a good point, Kyle, that you're bringing up because that data as well could tell us where the access issues are. Yeah. You know, for patients getting to the right treatment programs, especially people in rural areas and, yep. and what have you. What are they doing? If they get diagnosed at all, yep. you know, how are they how are they getting treatment? Yeah. When they haven't got a car and they haven't got a way to to, right. to right. And you know when that really hit home for me, I was in uh, Latin America, we were doing this Latin America oncology uh, program for all the countries down there. And it was really fascinating when we started looking at what data they wanted to collect. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about medical history. Right. It was about, you know, how far do you drive? How, how do you get care? Right. Because like in Brazil, you go to Sao Paulo and that's about it. Right. Right. Or right. Rio. Right. If you're in any of the other, you know, geography, you're traveling. And that impacts your health care. And language and ethnicity. I huge, mean, you know, there, there are some cultural issues with various different ethnicities where, you know, they don't trust anybody outside their family. Mm -hmm. So they don't trust an oncologist or, you know, uh, somebody like that. So how do they get yeah. care? Yeah. And down there was really fascinating. Yeah. You, you know, the, the advocacy foundations, it was more about... Um, when we walked into the room, it was, you know, and here's our staff of lawyers. And I thought, why do you have a staff of lawyers? Well, down there, you don't just use, you don't just go to the pharmaceutical or you don't go to the pharmacy and just pick up your drug. You actually have to sue the government to bring your drug into the country. Yeah, yeah. So down there, the, the problem is about getting access to drugs yeah, sure. and drug approval. And that's more important in a lot of cases right. than you know, the actual right. medical history. So it, you know, the geography varies too, but that's why I think these international types of programs, right? you, you know, you need to do a global. Right, oh yeah, it's global, right, we're, do, we're no, doing I just, global. <laughs> and, and this is gonna help us get so much more information to get the right drug to the right patient at the right, right time. That's right. Beyond, you know, well, what we're collecting and, at the moment. And I think it's gonna help us to not, you know, we talk all the time about not trying to reinvent the wheel. It's identifying the gaps, where are the gaps, and then how do we fill them? And registries are a perfect place to kind yeah. of be able to kind of pull out Absolutely. what those gaps are and where they are yeah. and how they differ because you know, here in the Bay Area might be different, not might be, is different, is different than, right. you know, than the Appalachians, for example, yeah, right? exactly. So I yeah. think it, it, it's important, it's important yeah. for that reason. And too. what struck me was when I think the first time we met with you all, mm -hmm. um, you described that, you know, most, what, 80% of the patients are seen in a rural mm -hmm. hospital, not at right. a large right. academic research right. center. Right. And I think right. that the medical community in general tends to think of, Mayo and Harvard. Exactly. Right. And that's not that's not the case. That's not the case. The majority of patients are in the community where the education really well, isn't as great. And that's a really good point because you know you all know the, about all the key opinion leaders that we work with around the globe, and you know even five years ago we talked to them about challenges with molecular testing. At that point, just for EGFR, right? And and they're like, oh, no, 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 everybody's getting tested for EGFR. <laughs> well, maybe in the academic setting, right? That's but right. they were disconnected from what was happening where 80% right. of the patients were being right. seen because right. it, wasn't, it wasn't the fact. So, exactly. Yeah, registries like this and being able to pull that, de that data and, and push it then back out in a, in a way that makes sense, right? That people can kind of understand yeah. it and kind of yeah. like have these big aha moments. And I think... There's going to be a there's the potential for a lot of aha, aha moments. moments. Absolutely, yeah. it's like oh my gosh, of yeah. course, look at yeah. that. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned the pushing it out. You, you know, that's something that we're huge believers in. Mm -hmm. Is if patients are taking the time to contribute their information, for gosh sakes, they should be able to see what everybody else contributed. You right. Know, it, yeah. We don't need people's names, and you know, right. it's not Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's it's all de-identified. No one knows who you are. Right. But if you go in and you should be able to compare yourself against your peers, if you will. Mm -hmm. And they will be. And what, are, yeah, and what are you yeah. experiencing? Mm -hmm. Right. right? Exactly. And, you know, my dream would be we eventually can push this down to the point of care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So now if you're in a rural hospital, right. a doctor can pull it up and say, right. well, what are other people doing across the country? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, exactly. for people that yeah. kind of look like this. Right. Exactly. So I think. Yeah. We're kind of jumping all over. No, uh, no, 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 no. It's fine. The conversation's great, and I love it. It's kind of naturally, kind of ebbing and flowing into different parts of what what we wanted to talk about tonight. So, with that being said, I want to talk a little bit about you know the difference in registries because some registries and maybe what makes the 
um, our foundation's registry a little bit different is most of them tend to be point in time information, right? Yeah. Where somebody's r rolling out a survey for a single purpose, one, and that's usually a self-serving purpose because they're not sharing that information. It's yeah. they need to know something because they're going to go after it. Yeah. So, how what is sort of the ratio of different registries or or patient insights or surveys that are out there versus sort of this, you know, this longitudinal sort of approach to yeah. looking at what, what a patient Lots generated. of them today are very much point in time, yeah. as you mentioned. And, you know, that's why I'm not a big fan of the word registry, just because it's it's like, you know... It already has It's a, a one-time deal, right? Right, yeah, it, it already has a name, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where, where insights change over time, right? You know, what you're experiencing today might be different than what you're experiencing three months from now. Right. Um, and, you know, especially if, if, if your diagnosis goes metastatic, for example, right? I mean, everything kind of changes. So you need to follow folks. Uh, I would say historically, uh, most most of these programs have been point in time. Exactly. Um, we're, we've always done longitudinal. Yeah. Um, where we'll actually send an a, a email out to to folks to say, hey, you know, come back and take your three month check in or your, mm -hmm. your six month check in, and it's and it's a subset of the questions. You know, you don't need to ask them their their birthday again. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But, but yeah. you want to know what changed over time, and if you start doing enough of that and start tracking people on a regular basis, you can start identifying the the journey. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's helpful for patients too to have all their information in one place mm -hmm. where they're not rifling through notes like oh, yeah. like I'm always doing. It's like what files that in, you know, and yeah. you know, and 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 having to write all of this stuff all over again. Yeah. Will they be able to like print their data and when they're going to a new doctor so they can just go here? Here it all is. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the age, the electronic medical records are certainly getting better at doing that. But, mm -hmm. but certainly, you can uh, today you can print out your profile and, yeah. and take that that yeah. with you and yeah. and show that and share that with other folks. Because think how laborious it is when you when you change doctors or yeah. you know your cancer changes and you get a second opinion or all all the paperwork that you have to fill out. Yeah, and you more often than not you can't remember. It's like I don't know. It was about a year exactly. ago. I think I don't know. Yeah. So it's know. sort of there's a the potential for a dual purpose of like a health locker, if you will, all mm -hmm. your information being yeah. sort of in one place. Although it's not the 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 idea behind the registry is not no, just the health that's locker. Not, no, it's so it's much bigger. one more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more. One more yeah. reason. Yeah. 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 So the so for those of you who haven't um, yet uh, um, signed up and joined the the, uh, uh, the lung cancer registry, um, what we're looking at is okay, where are you right now? But we're also taking a look back at how you got here, beginning with you know sort of symptoms misdiagnoses, what were those, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And then we're able to follow you longitudinally with what Kyle was referring to is maybe some follow-up emails three, six months down the road saying, okay, has anything changed? What has changed? What does that look like? But on top of that, um, the registry enables us to, to mine it, if you will. Mm -hmm. So if you're an EGFR or an ALK patient or, or if you don't have any markers, right, and, and industry is working on a particular drug or has a trial happening and they're looking for specific subtypes, we can then reach back out to you and say, hey, this is what's coming down the pike and this is maybe what, what industry is looking for, right? So there's so many possibilities, we, quality of life, right? How can we better, yep. you know, what, what quality of life looks like for a patient? There's, yep. there's, there's a ton of um, um, ways that we can mm -hmm. use this registry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, generally we we do see these things evolve over time, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. we're just going to continue to create, you know, additional questionnaires and collect more data because you don't know what you know until you start collecting this information. Exactly. But exactly. you mentioned something really important, Bonnie, which is kind of survey fatigue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you, I'm sure everybody's been asked to complete questionnaires about your your journey, right? And sure. About the fifteenth time you do that, you get a little tired of it, right? Um, so, so one of the things that that we're excited about is through a program like this, we can actually deliver multiple different researcher type of studies, right, through this same yep. registry program. Yeah, right. So, you know, if there is this ability to reuse some of that data. Hopefully, we won't have to ask those same questions over, over and over and over again. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, in other words, yeah. the information you've already put in, if there are similar questions in a follow-on survey, it'll it'll autofill that. So, so you don't have to do it. And I think that's one of the reasons I think this meeting is so important, 
um, because we always go into things like, well, what's in it for the patient, right? Yeah. What's in it for the patient? Because if there's not something in it for the patient at the end of the day, we're not, we're not going to bother with it. But yeah. I think it's important that that we let you all know why this is a benefit to you, where that benefit lies, right? And that's kind of what I hope to get out of this tonight, <laughs> right? Yeah, and and you know, I, I I'm just laughing because I'm 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 seeing a physician tomorrow that is a new new one for me. And I thought, if they give me one more paper to fill out, mm -hmm. I'm going to cancel the appointment. I'm not even going to go, you know, because it's taking t way too much time yeah. to keep doing this. And then I thought to myself, how many different times have I filled out these exact same papers yeah. in my lifetime, right? I don't know if too many to count. going to help with that, not now. Right. But no, but it, have but, to fill out paperwork. No, but 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 it's it's you know it's going to be a lot easier because you can access. You know all that information. Yeah. yeah. But imagine if if we could mine this registry and find these commonalities. And you and Kyle were kind of talking earlier, and Kyle briefly touched on things that maybe people aren't really looking for. The researchers right. aren't looking for. Right. The doctors aren't talking about. We mentioned blood type and right. and blue eyes. And you mentioned um, another uh, patient insight network that you work with mm -hmm. that where there was facial characteristics. Facial recognition. Yeah. yeah. Facial features. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That actually were indicative of certain diseases. And these are the types of things that without your participation in the registries, right. we won't know. That's right. Because right. nobody's asking. Your right. doctors aren't asking. Right. I know a physician that, that we work with that diagnosed himself with cancer because he had a throbbing carotid artery. Hmm. And he was shaving and he knew exactly what was wrong with him. He took himself to the hospital and said, I've got such and such. And they said, well, you're going to have to have the test. And he said, I know, but I've, I, I'm telling you, I have. Wow. So, yeah. and he did. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so some of the purposes I have down here, sort of in my notes, talking about um, um, the purposes of registries. And these are just a few examples, but um, to facilitate patient participation in research. So yeah. this kind of goes back to clinical trials and you know we are we are very fond of clinical trials and quite often even in the first line setting they're the best best first line option for a patient. So um, really being able to up front and this is if you can catch them early mm -hmm. right before before treatments has started how important that is and can you talk a little bit Kyle about one of the features that we, we haven't added or we haven't flipped the switch on yet, yep. um, um, and that's the clinical trial matching. Yeah, so it's really important, and, and uh, y you know, without participation in clinical trials, there's just not going to be any treatments mm -hmm. um, be because the FDA needs to approve them. And if people don't participate, and I don't, you know the statistics a lot better than I do, what, 10% of the eligible people participate, something like that? Four. Four percent. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. really low. Right. And the pharmaceutical companies are, are dying for participation in these programs, but they just haven't found a really good way to recruit these folks. So what we have done is in, in the, the registry program is provide a kind of a clinical trial matching service um, where based on your age and your diagnosis stage and some other um, high level information, we can actually suggest clinical trials that, that you could be qualified for in your geographic area. Um, and then, you know, you could take that information to your doctor mm -hmm. and ask them if that's suitable for you. Um, but, but raising the awareness of, of clinical trial participation is huge. Yeah. And, and I yeah. think you guys are going to love this tool and we, we have it up, um, on our, on our website right now and we're working with a group called Antidote and it, it, the use of it is so easy and we're, we're just waiting on a couple little, uh, Again, technology. More things. features. Yeah, yeah, for, for to, to, to flip the switch on the registry. But um, it's really so, it's as easy as typing in like three or four different fields, yeah. and it'll spit back out at you a wealth of information. Um, um, and the thing about clinical trials, which we also talk about a lot, is quite often the doctors will be very familiar with a clinical trial that is in their facility, whether it's an academic right. center or a larger com community center, but they don't know about all the clinical trials that are going on that you could potentially benefit from. So this tool, I think, is going to be a really, really, really important part um, um, of what we're doing moving forward to try to help facilitate en enrollment. Well, you know, so much of it, and you know, uh, most of our patients are really smart and they're really good at you know advocating for themselves, and I like to think we're part of you know, getting them, getting them to that point. But, you know, this is top down, bottom up. Mm 
bottom up, bottom being the patient, top being the researcher and the academic and the pharmaceutical companies. But um, if you're being treated in the community, it's very difficult for them to stay on top of everything going on in the world, mm -hmm. or let alone the United States. And they don't know, you know, I mean, they're, they're dialing into clinicaltrials.gov, which is a nightmare, an absolute nightmare, trying to find a clinical trial there. So if you do the work for yourself, easily on this registry, it'll be easy for you to do. Take it to your doctor. Because some of these doctors are seeing 20 patients a day. Mm -hmm. They just don't have time. Their average time with a patient is about 15 minutes. But yeah, so, And it doesn't just tell you about the clinical trial. It provides you the link to the trial and a contact phone number of someone to call you know, that, that's, that's, that's part of running the clinical trial that you can actually talk to yeah. and have a conversation with. So it's really giving you immediate and direct access to the, tr to the trial site. And you can pick, if you're somebody who's willing to, to look for trials around the, you know, around the country, mm -hmm. regardless of you know, right. how far, right. that, that's a field option for you. So it doesn't necessarily have to just be something you know, in, your, in your backyard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you can yeah. pick and choose. Yeah. yeah, it's really exciting because I think this has been one of our, one of our big kind of yeah, absolutely. thorns on our side is right, how, how, how to get this, because even me, you yeah. know, I've been on clinicaltrials.gov a million times and I'm still like, my eyes are crossing after it's the horrible. first four minutes. Yeah, it's yeah. awful. Well, you know, it's just not patient friendly. No, no, no. no, no. But but the importance of clinical trials cannot be overstated. No, yeah. no. Um, and and I think the mm -hmm. most people that that ha aren't like in the industry or you know what what we do, when you tell them only four percent, that that that's just a number that is appalling. Mm -hmm. But but it's I don't think it's a lack of people wanting to participate. No, it's not. It's not. they don't and know. It always makes me. It gets me a little bit upset because it sounds quite often when we're hearing and, and involved in discussions like this, saying, well, you know, patients only participate 4%. I'm right. thinking, no, 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 let's not blame the patient, okay? Right. Let's not blame the patient because this is a communication problem. It is. And uh, that's, that's not their fault. Yeah. Patients are always asking, well, is there a clinical trial that is good for me? And, Absolutely. Yeah, all And the again, time. this kind of all points back to your doctor may have a trial of their own that they're trying to accrue. And so if you don't fit into that trial, they may not know about what's happening at a hospital right. 20 right. miles down right. the road. They're, they're also not totally in tune with all of the trials that are open well, and Yeah, they operating. can't keep on top of it. No, no they can't. They can't. Yeah, particularly they can't. in Long. There's right. so, right. so, so, so right. many things. Right. So many things right. happening. So one of the things we were also talking about earlier was understanding disease course and how these registries or, in, or, or um, patient insight platforms can, can help with that. And mom, you, you gave the example of, you know, and we all know this, whether you're a targeted therapy patient, an immunotherapy patient, or a chemotherapy patient, why, does, why do some drugs work better and or longer on some patients than others, right? Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is we don't know. We don't know why. But using these registries and getting insights from you, we may again be able to find those patterns. Why does you know, uh, an, an EGFR drug work for some patients that come here you know, four, five, six years. years, and another person may progress after four, five, six months? Right. Right? What, what, is, what is different about those patients? Because they have the same mutation, mm -hmm. right? Something else is going on, yeah. and, and these registries well, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, David Gandera uh, uh, did a living room here a couple years ago, and, he, and he's, done, he's done some since. But in that one, he asked every patient in the room, um, how many types of lung cancer do you think there are? And somebody said five, and somebody said ten, and, and they were given all different kinds of numbers. And he said, no, there are as many lung cancers as there are people that have it because each and every patient is unique. And when they get lung cancer, it, re it, it reacts differently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, different drugs work and, and don't. So everyone is very unique. And I think the point of the registry is to define that uniqueness and discover yeah. mm -hmm. that uniqueness. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and one of the things that makes um, our registry cool is it's not just you know patient reported insights, but there is the ability right now to upload um, files, right? Medical records. So whether it's a you know some a pathology record or or a scan result or something like that. 
that we can then pull information from and then have that. So we could have like your genomic information, for example, alongside your patient reported sort of day-to-day -day yep. information and be able to look at, at and, and, and compare based on, you know, that's just right. one, one example. Right. Yep. One, because yeah. you, could, you could have had a, a full-on um, comprehensive genomic profile done when you were diagnosed. And, and it could be that you had no targeted um, genetics, but it also could be a year later that you progress or whatever and you go back to that initial report and think, ah, it was there all along. We just didn't know that you had it and that it, it just popped up. Yeah, genetics in general is just kind of a fascinating thing. It's completely right? fascinating. You know, yeah. and if, you know, more and more we're, doing, we're seeing panels. Right, and, and right. You know, you mentioned EGRF and, right. and these, you know what, there might be other genes implicated, but you just don't know yet. Right, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's, there's trials out there happening and drugs being approved yeah. that, you know, weren't on your, your report the first time because there was no drug or right. trial, but now there is a trial and now there is a drug. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the genomic factor, and just since we're talking about it, is, you know, um, for those that, that may be new, um, you know, there's, there's three, three mutations that hopefully, at minimum, your doctor's testing for, and that's EGFR, ALK, and ROS1, um, that have approved targeted drugs for them. But to your point, some of these more comprehensive genomic profiles are looking at hundreds of mutations mm -hmm. known to cancer, some of which don't have any drugs, right? In, yet. In, in, yet. Yet. And some of which have drugs in trials. And, and it's so important to have as much information up front as you can, because even if there's not something right now, there may be something, you know, 6, 12, 18 months right. from now. And right. things we say this over and over and over, things are happening so fast and furious, particularly in the lung cancer space. Um, it's so important to have as much information as you can. Yeah, you have to have the data yeah. because you can't go through all this paperwork and files and newspapers and, and mm -hmm. it'll make you crazy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have an easy place to go mm -hmm. to find out what's new yeah. and what's now matching and what's not. So uh, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about privacy and then I wanna go in and talk about how this data might be used and give some examples and okay. Ganit can probably chime in on this too. Um, but opting in and privacy, because um, I know a lot of people are concerned about that. Yep. You know, what, what kind of information am I giving out? What's enough? What's, what's too much? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and how that might impact their life. Can you talk a little bit about? Sure. So, so um, first of all, as far as like privacy and security, so we also do this for the, the National Institutes of Health, um, which is really rigorous, right? So when the government, you know, is, is concerned about privacy, they make you jump through a lot of hoops. And we've jumped through all those hoops successfully. Um, we're one of the few groups that, that are able to collect personal identifying information on behalf of the government, which means we really gotta be buttoned up when it comes to privacy and security of your data. But when people are, are opting in, you opt in, and you choose to participate. Um, you can choose to be contacted, you can choose not to be contacted. Um, you can decide you wanna share your data for research or not. Um, it's really up to you, um, but but everything that you put in there is only accessible um, by the staff. It's not accessible by pharmaceutical companies. You, you know, we never ever have given out contact information to anyone. Um, we never will. Um, you know, you guys are the trusted gatekeepers, right? And you all are trusting your data with with you know Bonnie and Danielle um, and and the team. Um, but our job is to safeguard that information and make sure that, that when you are putting that data there, it's secure. And we're not gonna give it out willy-nilly to, to people unless there's a really good reason for that. Um, now, and, and I'm sorry, go ahead. I can guarantee you, I will not have access to your data. I am not Miss Technology. I know what technology will do and can do, but I won't be accessing anything and I won't have the codes or the numbers or anything. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> this is very, 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 it's very important. <laughs> very true. Yeah. But yeah. when someone wants to communicate with, yeah. with the patient community, right, right we'll do that. Right, mm -hmm. but, exactly. but that's going to be, you know, sending out newsletters or emails mm -hmm. or, 
or contacting you, you know, based on your giving contact you the preferences. information. Right? You right. And we're not sharing any contact information. What we are sharing is the the you know anonymous aggregated information from everybody in the system. So you can start connecting those dots. But we would never share um, identifying information unless you told us to. Um, in some cases there are, you, you right. know, when people want to opt into a clinical trial, mm -hmm. you know, through a, through a, a registry program, the way that we've done that in the past is we'll either send them out study notices or they could potentially, we could have a link right on the site where they opt into it, like what you said with the clinical trial recruitment. Mm -hmm. But in that case, it's you providing your information to that clinical trial PI, not us, right? right? We're just telling you that it's available but we're not gonna give them your name and address and tell them to start yeah. calling you. Yeah. Right. Um, it's up to you right. to reach out. Yeah, right. and there's different right. levels of opting in, you know, as, as Kyle pointed out, and, um, you know, we have some thoughts moving forward on some of our own research partnerships that, that, um, uh, that we're gonna be doing um, and what it might look like. You know, one, um, Ganit, I don't know if you wanna grab a mic and, and talk a little bit about how you would like to use the registry as a ALCF representative. Uh, there you go. Sorry. Oh, and everybody, if you didn't know, Ganit's going to have a baby. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the registry is so cool in so many different ways, especially, you know, for the research studies and the clinical trials that we are designing from within ALCF and Alchemy. You know, I'll give a couple examples. Like, for example, we are planning to run um, a study on the effects of immunotherapy, right? Immunotherapy is a relatively new uh, treatment option for lung cancer, melanoma, and a couple other diseases. And we still don't know what the long-term impact is, you know, um, <clears throat> and what kinds of side effects patients can have being on immunotherapy drugs for multiple many years, right? So what we are planning to do is, through the registry, collect this kind of information, because we can do it longitudinally, right? We can we can uh, work with these patients who've been on immunotherapy drugs and every three months, six months, you know, collect information on how they are feeling. And patients can then connect amongst each other, you know, reach out to other patients who've been on immunotherapy drugs and share insights amongst, you know, themselves. So patients benefit, we benefit. And how, you know, this, this kind of insight will also help us and the research community develop better drugs in the future so that, you know, these kinds of side effects can be minimized, et cetera. So that's one example. Another example is, um, you know, we are designing a study in the liquid biopsy space using, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, using circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor DNA to track if the, your disease is responding to the drugs that you are on, if your disease has stopped responding, you know, using that technology, using liquid biopsies. And, you know, even there, what we can do is we can bring in the registry component uh, and on a longer term basis, collect this information and continue to track your disease through the information that you share and then also the information that can be pulled in from your medical records. So it's going to help research tremendously because here what we're doing is we're not going to collect like just a one-time snapshot in time. We are collecting your data over a long period of time so that we know what effects are of the treatments that you're on how you're responding to them, what side effects you're getting, et cetera, which will help research to a huge extent. So in that sense, it's supremely exciting that we can you know, marry two different projects from within our foundations, the registry and our research studies and clinical trials. That's great. That yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Ganit. And, and Ganit touched a little bit on your electronic medical records. So every time you go to the doctor, I can't remember if Kyle said it or, or you said it, Mom, you know, your doctor sits there and he's typing in a computer. Well, he's typing into your electronic health, electronic health record. And that information stays in your health record. It doesn't really go anywhere. Nobody's mining it for anything. It's just sitting there, right? Sort of useless to every anyone except sort of your doctor who, who may or may not go back and refer to it from time to time. So the, the, the um, lung cancer registry um, fairly soon, really soon, is going to have the option for you to, again, opt in. All of this is an ask of you. It's not a you must do to be part of the registry. Um, opt in to attach to your electronic health record so that if and when we needed information, we could then go right into your record and, and pull that information to to, to Ganit's point. And it's a really cool option going back to what we talked about a little bit earlier 
about being able to kind of connect those dots from what the patient is reporting mm -hmm. and ma marrying that or matching it with what the health records are, are saying. Yeah, and, and electronic medical records are kind of interesting, right? Because, you, you know, and just to be specific about what we would pull from that would be, you know, you know medications, um, um, ICD-9 codes, which are, you know, like what, what diseases have you had? Because many people have more than one disease, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, and... Um, test results, you know, very structured that are relevant just to, to lung cancer. Mm -hmm. We don't want to pull all, you know, all your records. Every time you everything. had strep throat. No, yeah. you know, just very specific items that are important. And, and I think the misnomer with, with electronic medical records is that, you know, that's, that's the holy grail for research. The reality is, my opinion, is that electronic medical records are billing systems. It's, it's so that the, the hospital systems can get paid at the end of the day. Yes, they take notes in there, mm -hmm. but it's not in a format that is really conducive for research, if right. you will. That's right. and, and again, that's why patient reported information is so critical. Right. Because a lot of people just say, well, we'll just integrate all the electronic medical records together right. and boom, there you go. Right, exactly. I don't think so. No. Because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you're not going to get the insights. Mm -hmm. You're going to know what drugs people are on, and that's really valuable. Mm -hmm. But you don't know... Why did they go off that drug? Was it because of cost? Was it because, you know, it upset your stomach? Right. Was right. it because the doctor just told you to switch? Insurance wouldn't pay. Insurance wouldn't pay. These are things that are not captured in, mm -hmm. in an electronic medical record. It's right. just they were on this drug and now they're on that drug. And that's it. And we need you to help fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And this, you, we talked, you just, somebody just mentioned payers and insurance. and, and there is a huge potential based on some of the questions we already have and based on some potential follow-on surveys to really have impact, you know, when looking, talking with the payers and, yep. and affecting yep. change in that space yep. based on the information you all are providing. Yep. Being able to hopefully change things so these drugs are being paid for, they, they are, that, that we can prove the benefit to the insurance companies to get them to cover the drugs. That's we, an important point. Well, yeah. well it's, it's a really important point because we could possibly prove that the cost per patient uh, was lower in one case than they had imagined. Mm -hmm. um, and we can also pr show that maybe the cost per patient on this particular drug, like a standard chemo, was higher because there were more hospital visits and ER visits and collapsed lungs and this, that, and another. Um, and I think if we start kind of coming up with cost per patient, yep. we can really do some significant work with insurance companies to get to get those um, charges down mm -hmm. yep. and Agreed. manageable. Agreed. So I have a question. I'm, well, before I ask my question, I want to pause and ask if anyone in the room or online has any questions. Go ahead there. Oh, you got to grab a, there you go. Hi, this is really interesting to me. And I'm wondering, is there a registry of uh, clinical trials? I know there's the clinicaltrials.gov. Is there a worldwide registry? Because there are so many different kinds of cancer and there are so many different kinds of perhaps treatments. Is there a, a registry that, that can be do you mean that it compares the data within that's coming out of each individual clinical trial? There is not. There's been a lot of discussion about, you know, potentially opening up the data collected under the trials and, and making that available. There is an international register clinical trials by, by uh, World Health Organization, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so the problem is um, that there are the databases that, that show what trials are available but there's no database of what are the outcomes of those trials necessarily kind of in real time, right? I mean, well, more and, and more they're starting to publish it. And the SEER information, yep. right? Yep. Which is, which is a, a, a data five collection of uh, cancer patient information is five years behind. So if you had a question today uh, about uh, a what's certain- What's happening today. What's happening today, you couldn't get it. For five years. But I think this is really important, and I think it's, I, I, I want to talk about it a little bit because I think it's another thing that separates the lung cancer registry from most other sets of data, right? Whether it's in a registry or in clinical trials or whatever. Um, and that's people who are willing to share their data 
and people who are not, mm -hmm. right? We purposefully set up this registry as a, this open source registry that we want to share with anyone who wants access to it in order to move the needle forward. Mm -hmm. Because what's the use in collecting all this data if we're only keeping it for you know, five or six studies we have running through alchemy? It makes it, no sense. It, exactly, and, it, and if, you, if you imagine the ocean and islands of information, you know, I, I, that's, that's my picture of what's happening currently. Lots of different entities have different information, but there's no talking. And there's a lot of different reasons why they're not sharing and they're not talking and what have you. Our only vested interest is patient survival. Whatever we can do to move this along and, and you know, see progress faster, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're willing to do and spend the money to do. Ron, do you have a question? I see you holding a mic. I always have a question. I know you do. <laughs> um, the 4% ratio of um, participants in, in trials is, 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 is low. Oh. And, and I said, what could make that be more enticing? Well, you know, you have to drive all that way to get there. You fight your way through the paperwork maze. And then you have to pay two bucks for parking or something like that. It's like, could we get at least free parking? <laughs> well, I'm gonna advocate for free parking and, and right. maybe maybe even like, you know, a little stipend for being a guinea, uh, a guinea pig, you know? Well, and you know what, Ron, to your point, you live in, in the Bay Area and you, you are surrounded by academic centers that have clinical trials. Right. Most people are not that fortunate, so they have to fly and they have to stay in hotels, and it's a much bigger cost. But, I, but, I, but I think even still, it's a really good point because there we, there's a lot of talk with a lot of our partners yeah. about how do we improve clinical trials so as to successfully enroll patients, so on and so forth, but this is where this registry could become really useful, right. where we can ask patients that have clicked, yes, I've been in a clinical trial, what was your experience, what worked, what didn't work, you know, what, what would make it better. All, we could have all of these things that we could then have this mass data to bring back to these folks and say, this free is park. what the patient wants, right? right? Yeah, free parking. And, right, right. We need free parking. Exactly. Yeah. And um, yes, abs absolutely, absolutely true. Um, Joan, did you have a follow-up? I have a quick question is that um, it seems like the different lung cancer organizations have their own different registries in it. Are you talking with each other you know, to try to consolidate and um, mm -hmm. standardize so, some of the information? Mm -hmm. so th we have asked every single advocacy group out there. We are, we are working with American Lung Association. They opted in. We asked absolutely everyone. Yeah, and I think, and I'm not familiar with anybody else that has a registry like this. People might do surveys and be collecting data. I, I'm not, I don't know, maybe there is. I, I'm not yeah, sure who, I, I know that the, that the LCA has an early detection, uh, a one around screening and early detection, but other than that, I'm not, anyway, it doesn't matter. To, to my mom's point, everyone was asked, we purposefully, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull it up a, in a little bit here, um, made this a non-branded site. So it's not branded to the ALCF, it's not branded to the ALA. We really wanted everyone to feel like they could come in, they could join, um, and, then, and I'm going to ask the question of Kyle in just a minute because we know that, you know, 50 patients isn't going to make or break what's happening in this space. You know, we need a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to share this information and to make it available to all the advocacy groups and, and even outside of ag right. advocacy groups, you know, that, that are potentially working in this space. And, and to my mom's point, the ALA did join on and partner with us right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the others are still thinking and about there, it. Others are thinking, mm -hmm. and, and there are other um, institutions that are saying, you know, the one we have just isn't working. We'd rather have it be an international, because mm -hmm. this really is an international registry. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody that wants in can get in. And it's called the Lung Cancer Registry. You know, we we spent the money to make this happen and, and do it, and anybody can join us mm -hmm. without without mm -hmm. spending a dime. Yeah, and I know that, and I, like I said, I, I want to kind of take back what I said earlier. Like I said, I know there are some of these point in time registries or surveys where maybe somebody's, 
you know, doing a survey on an ALK patient or, mm -hmm. or right. you know, something. Right. And so they're looking just for specific subtypes. There's probably whatever. lots of researcher, you, you know, specific registries, mm -hmm. even hospital right. systems we see right. sometimes mm -hmm. put these up. You know, the problem that, that we see, and this is kind of near and dear to my heart, is, you know, the open access piece. Exactly. And, uh, you, know, we, you know, I don't blame researchers. The system is set up such that they collect this data and then, you know, they publish on it. You know, you've heard the term publish or perish, right? Mm -hmm. or, and, and, they, and they get grants out of it. So there's, there is a built-in systemic motivation um, for academic researchers to potentially keep some of this data close to the vest. Mm -hmm. um, we call that data mining, but it, as in data, this is mine. mine. Yeah, mine. mine. Right? Yeah. It, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's a different thing. Yeah. And, you know, to your credit, um, you have been super open and invited the other folks. My dream would be that the homepage ends up looking like a NASCAR. Absolutely. Because you got so Everybody's many logos logo on it, right? On it. Boom, boom, that, boom, boom. That's boom. how you have a successful yep. program. Right. Can eat, yeah. I just wanted to touch upon what Kyle just said about open source and open access and give an example to everybody how this can help patients and how it can move the needle on research and finding new treatments, et cetera. And the example is this. So we are running a study for ROS1 fusion-driven cancers. This is a relatively rare molecular subtype. It's seen in close to about 1% to 2% of several different cancers, cancer types, non-small cell lung cancer, glioblastoma, melanoma, ovarian, gastric, et cetera. In each of these cancers, ROS1 is probably around 1% to 2%. Mm. Because, you know, this is, it's, a, it's a relatively rare subtype. Not many people are working on it. So, you know, many patients who had this alteration got together and they came and they approached the foundation and they said, we want you guys to look at ROS1 fusions. We want you to do something for us. And we said, yes, absolutely, why not? And let's do something in a pan-cancer fashion, not just look at ROS1 in lung, we look at ROS1 across different cancer types and collect this information. We launched a survey, <coughs> collected a lot of information. There, there were 209 questions. So it was a lengthy, was a lot. big yeah. survey. Was it right? and patients were driven, yeah, patients responded, shared all of this information with us, and we are making this a longitudinal survey. So we are going to be collecting lots of information, not 209 questions each time, because you've already upfront answered many of these questions, but you know, close to about like 30 questions every couple months to follow what's happening, you know, how you're responding to treatment, whether you, you know, if you faced any side effects, if you're on a clinical trial, et cetera, and capture all of this information over a long period of multiple years. And the plan is to make all of this data open access, open source to whoever wants to look at it. Obviously de-identified, but it's going to be available to anybody, any researcher, any pharma company that, wa that wants to look at this so that they can identify, we can identify together as a community patterns in this data and come up with new drug targets, come up with new, you know, new ways of diagnosing emergence of resistance, you know, all of these things that will benefit patients today and in years to come. So that's one example mm -hmm. how we are using the registry platform to impact treatment decisions, et cetera. And Gunit, in, in a perfect world, wouldn't it be wonderful because of the pan-can idea and looking across different, uh, different organs that, that uh, people have the ROS1 marker, that we actually are able to maybe go to a pharmaceutical company or do it ourselves, a clinical trial to actually see if there's a drug that's already on the market, mm -hmm. already being used for ROS, people with a ROS1 mutation in another cancer. Absolutely, Bonnie. And you know, this is this is an example of a recent patient. Obviously, I'm not going to name names, but this is somebody who had cholangiocarcinoma, right? And they were never tested for ROS1 fusions. Through our platform, through the ROS1 study, they found out about this entire initiative, and they came to know that you know there is a targeted treatment for ROS1 fusions, crizotinib. Spoke with their doctor about it. Doctor prescribed them this treatment, and it's working beautifully. They have been no, no evidence of, of disease for close to about 10 months now. Right, so this is insights in one cancer that can help patients in a different kind of cancer with the same alteration. And I think that's a great point, I, for right. two things. So one, uh, that survey went out before our registry was complete, so mm -hmm. just for the right. record. Exactly, um, exactly. Um, exactly. That, 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 it was like a little mini epi study that went out on the, on the ROS1 patients. And two, back to kind of what, what Joan said and, and, and uh, about collaborative and being out there and, and Kyle touched on it and 
can eat just a two. It's not just, we will collaborate. We know we're not gonna do this on our own. We know we can't do this on our own. So we are open to any conversation with anybody about how to potentially collaborate. And as Ganit's example just so beautifully pointed out, not just in lung, if it makes sense to collaborate in other diseases where there are these commonalities mm -hmm. for the purpose of discovery, exactly. we, are, we are your people. We, we, we and, and especially for the orphan cancers that really, you know, um, they don't get a lot of attention because there are so low incidence of of um, onset, so that we that could be a huge help to them, mm -hmm. and a huge help to uh, the network as well. Because I would be very surprised if we don't find some of these mutations in some of these orphan cancers. Absolutely. Okay. And I mean, you mentioned cholangiocarcinoma. Right. We happen exactly. to have a cholangiocarcinoma right. registry. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We should talk to them and yeah. and hook you guys up. Hello. Hello. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. You, you know, but that's yeah. the collaborative right. stuff that exactly. I think um, mm -hmm. needs because to happen. Because they can't more. they can't start this on their own. Right. But um, you know, again, uh, you know, it may not seem terribly believable, but we really are open, and our goal. I I I would love to retire tomorrow and sit on a beach somewhere, and you know because I had seen the Wall Street Journal that says lung cancer, gone, done, finished, cured. That's, that's why we're in this, not for anything else. Um, I think Andre has an online question. Yeah, I actually have a text from David, um, just because he wants to put his piece in um, answer to Joan's question. He's saying that there are many lung cancer specific but registries, however, but they only have certain elements like clinical data or quality of life questions or genomic data, but again, none have all of our functionality or open source and available to all partners in lung cancer. And I think when Danielle goes um, through it, because I, I love seeing the demos of the of the registry itself, it really explains and really shows what it offers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have a question from um, somebody online. Um, what does IBM Watson do? Oh, that's good. Kyle. I can take a crack at Kyle. that, sure. So, so. Uh, you know, IBM Watson is getting a lot of press these days, um, and, it, and it's, you know, the artificial intelligence thing, right? Um, w what it's really good at is, is identifying patterns, um, and, and like for doing massive literature searches, for example. I mean, if you have um, uh, 10 million records in PubMed, right, you know, all the, which is where all the, the published literature is on disease, it's good for going through that, but, but what's challenging is healthcare, in particular, the, the linguistics of healthcare are tough because you have so many different words for lung cancer, right? I mean, you could, sometimes it's NSCLC, right? And acronyms. And, yeah, right. there are all these acronyms right. and people right. shorthand them, so it makes right. it difficult. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting opportunity I think it's a little overhyped, to be real honest with you, mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, it's not, it's not magic. You have, it's a computer, and computers operate on ones and zeros. And it's on or off. And so what you have to do with these AI types of systems is you have to train it on what they call a training set of data, right? But unless you have, an, back to why it's really important for the registry, unless we have enough data to train Watson about how to look at the data, it's not ever going to make any insights on the data. Exactly. You can't just exactly. magically point it at things and it's right. it's Merlin. You know, right. you you have to train right. it with data. Right. And the and the <clears throat> beauty of patients entering the data, they don't know most of the acronyms and all of the different <laughs> exactly. different language that's used within the industry. Yeah. You know, I, I I I've worked with several pharmaceutical companies actually writing protocols and and patient consent forms, and I keep telling them, oh my God, take take all of this stuff out of here, or at least put a glossary in so the yeah. patient can understand it. Mm -hmm. um, so less is more. Yeah, but you know where it may become very useful is maybe in, in looking at genetic tests, right? Absolutely. Because if you're doing full, full Absolutely. genomes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. One, or, or yeah. even exomes, yeah. you know, you're talking about yeah. tens right. of thousands of genes. Right, right. That's a lot of data for yeah. any human right. to go through. Yeah, exactly. and it's yeah. not, I mean, when you talk about different things, that different things are called, mm -hmm. not only that, but everybody calls them something different and or they want to change it. Is it, and this is a, not a very scientific clinical example, but precision medicine. 
right? Is it precision right. medicine? Is it, I mean, what are, what are we calling it? Is, is it, it personalized is medicine? Is it personalized is it medicine? Precision? Is it comprehensive genomic profiling? Is it next generation sequencing? So it's right. like there's so many different things that makes me crazy. But one of the, th I, I, I want to, this is an absolute sidebar and has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight. But you said ones and zeros on and off. Is that why the little button has the one slash zero on That's it? That's a great question. That's I never. I always awesome thought that trivia. is the dumbest thing ever. I'll have ever to look that for, up. Like, Maybe that's my true. Button on and off. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. that was a total yeah. sidebar. I'll have to look Sorry. that up. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. Does anybody know yeah. at all? Um, Andre, do you have any more questions online? <laughs> right. um, so let's talk a little bit about how registries are evolving. How do you see them evolving? I mm -hmm. see them be becoming much more open um, and accessible and more patient focused. Um, that that's definitely a trend that we've seen over the last. I don't know, even four or five years, um, that, that it's really been moving more to the patient-centric piece. You know, there was the, out of the Affordable Care Act, they formed this agency called uh, uh, PCORI, mm -hmm. which is Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute. Mm -hmm. And it's about making, you know, information revolve around the patient. Well, at the core of that, it's gotta be patient registries. Mm -hmm. So I certainly see that registries are getting more open, more um, patient-centric. But I believe that they're going to become more and more um, clinically laden as well. Mm -hmm. You know, where we're we're going to roll in more electronic medical record type of information. We have to. Because we have we to. We can't overburden the patient either. We can't. You know, and we can't tell them if you don't do this, it's just not going to happen because yep. we have to we have to help them do it. And and I think genetics are probably going to play a big piece there too. Absolutely. I I think that yep. the, we're at a really interesting time. Mm -hmm. You know, the internet's not that old. You know, I'm yeah, I'm kind of showing well, my age. Am I no, <laughs> no, so am I. So am I. So am I. And I remember. I remember. Anyway, yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember MySpace, right? right? Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. You know? Well, I can yeah. even go back further. We were just having yeah. a conversation yeah. at lunch the other day with some folks in the office, and. You know, when I even when I was in high school, yeah, my I, I was taught accounting on ledger sheets and how to type on a yeah. typewriter. Yeah. I mean that it was like I didn't like my kids now and they and they look at me like I'm from Mars because I can't figure yeah. something out on right. the computer. But right. it's not how I did it. I, I remember in, in in the 90s, early 90s, um, uh, in in my other job where I actually got paid, um, <laughs> I was I was talking to at a sales conference we were having, and I, I remember telling everybody in the room that you need to pay attention. The internet is going to be pervasive in everyone's lives in very short order. I had no idea how fast that was going to happen. Yeah, but I mean it happened overnight. Yeah, it really did. It did. So, and right. and you know we were lucky enough to kind of grow up in that right and, and see it. Yeah, I, you know, exactly. It's, it's exactly. Like, I remember you know, when they put the first computer on my desk, I went, oh. <laughs> you know, what about my IBM? It's like selected? when you got your first yeah. color TV. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you remember that. Yeah. yeah. But I remember getting excited when the typewriter had the correction backspace. You had the so first. you didn't have to use the thing. Oh, yeah, you could no actually have the correction. Was, you and your brother and sister yeah. had the first Apple Macintosh. Oh, my sister did, let's be honest. Well, Andrea did, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody else yeah. could operate. Yeah, let's be honest. Let's be honest. <laughs> no, no, but technology and the internet in particular is, is going to change everything. I mean, Absolutely. I mean it, Absolutely. It's already changed it a lot, Absolutely. but we still have a long it way to go. It got us to the moon. Yeah. Come on. It yeah. did. But we have a long way to go. We have a long yeah. way to go. And just there, when you the think, options are just when you think unimaginable. More, more cool and and yeah. and, and yeah. sort of novel yeah. and innovative isn't yeah. possible, somebody comes up with something where you're like Exactly. Hey, yeah. Exactly. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. So oh go ahead, buddy. I I'm just wondering if um, if the world data has changed um, maybe access to the internet isn't the same for the entire world. I know it. I know it's not. But how about our lung cancer data? Does it make the data lopsided for the for the people who don't have the ability to put that in? Or is a health organization? I'm going to, I'm going to, able to take a step. That? Yeah, and then I'm going to ask Anit um, to to maybe respond. But I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to say. Um, you know, the, the people particularly, one of the studies that we're running right now, a market research study, is reaching the unreachable. So these are the people we're talking about, right? People in these sort of lower socioeconomic places, maybe, where they don't have access to computers, let alone the internet, right? Um, how do we reach them? What does their cancer look like, right? How can we, through our community hospital program, maybe get 
this information from them because that's where they're going to see their doctors. But I want to use, um, you know, when EGFR was back early in clinical trials, it was recommended that, you know, that really the only people you need to test for are age for EGFR were Asian women. Right. That was, that was, those were the, your big hit rate was in Asian women, and we've clearly found over the last several years that that's not the case, right? And maybe if it's we had- It's a high number, but it's not, it's not- Correct. As, Th yeah. They have a high propensity for right. sure, but they're not the right. only ones who have EGFR, right? Exactly. right? The only ones that should be, should be tested. So I think, I don't know, Guinea, do you have a, do you have a, as a scientist, a, Thought on that. I totally agree with what you just said, uh, Danielle. So, you know, world over it varies, right? And within the U.S. itself, like Danielle touched upon it, 80% um, patients who are seen in the community setting, many of those patients probably don't have access to the internet or computers or whatever. And even their doctors are not sharing enough information with them, right? They aren't being tested for, you know, uh, EGFR, ALK, ROS1, even those, right? So that's one aspect within the U.S. and outside the U.S. There are some, you know, there are countries which which have the social medicine structure where governments, on the whole, on in the big picture scheme of things, are collecting this data and this information. Like for example, the U.K. is doing it, you know, um, uh, on a state level almost, so to speak, collecting information in, into a huge database. But then there are again countries like China and India, where um, you know access. Is, is an issue, and uh, patients cannot access molecular medicine because they cannot access molecular testing, et cetera. Drugs aren't approved, you don't have targeted treatments. So, you know, there's still chemotherapy that is being used. So, you know, it's very different. The treatment of lung cancer, the way it's uh, approached, the way it's diagnosed, and et cetera, it's very different. And the data that's collected is also very different. But increasingly, you know, we are seeing that there are some developing countries, China especially, that is collecting this information because they now see the, the power in, uh, you know, mining data through identifying, you know, these patterns in large data sets. And the Chinese government is investing in that space, so. Yeah, and, and Germany and others, and, and, you know, the data really is gonna drive the cost down. It's gonna drive the cost of healthcare down uh, as it, as it uh, starts to permeate uh, the world. It really will, because we'll, we'll, we'll be able to get the absolute right drug to the right patient at the right time. No more trial and error, you know, pinpoint. Now, now that's precision medicine. Yeah, and one of the, to, to the, the, one of the points that Ganit made, and one of the great things about when we do the demo, you'll see about um, this registry is that it's global. So we are pulling information where we can from those patients, and then hopefully you know, with some of the, the unreachable ones, as soon as this market research study is done, we'll have, you know, a better plan on how to go out and get them the information that they need, including, you know, how do we enable them to, to enter Because we already history. do know that in various mm -hmm. different ethnic groups that there are diseases that are more prominent than in any other ethnic group. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to find, well, Sam, Sam, you have one. Mm -hmm. Akanazi, is it? Ashkenazi. Mm -hmm. um, Sam is a breast cancer survivor. Um, uh, we're going to find more of that, I think, and, and that's what the data is going to bring us, mm -hmm. you know, higher propensity for various different things. And we're going to be able to get the right people into the right screening programs. Mm -hmm. You know, most people that retire spend most of their retirement getting colonoscopies and PSAs and, uh, and, and mammograms and, you know, all of this, you know, they're, they're wasting their time because they're probably not going to get any of those things. But we'll be able to identify who's going to get them and who, who has a higher, higher propensity to do it. So that's actually a good segue into my next question, and, and, and that is how many patient profiles or registrants do there need to be in order for there to be value mm -hmm. in a large scale? You, you know, value is kind of a, a loaded term, right? You, you know, more is always better, I'm gonna say infinite, right? But you know, for if, if you're looking for a st statistically relevant sample size, mm -hmm. you need a minimum of a thousand people mm -hmm. um, to, to, to make any reasonable, you know, correlations of the data. And, you, and does that challenge become even more great when there are so many different subtypes? Absolutely, yeah. So it's a thousand, like a thousand people in every one of those per subtypes, right? subtype. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 
And what we see is, you know, in a, in a really rare disease, like a mus muscular dystrophy or, you know, that's not super rare, but in the rare diseases, we can generally, re you know, register 25% of the, mm -hmm. the known population. In cancer, it's a different story, mm -hmm. you, you know, because it's a much, much more prevalent mm -hmm. um, or larger population, mm -hmm. right? And, and being able to reach all those folks mm -hmm. is difficult. Right. Um, and, and that's why, you, you know, we like to, to work with the advocacy groups Yep. Because nine times out of ten, somebody's going to call an advocacy group, and Absolutely. that's why and that's why it's important to to have all the advocacy groups partner if you can, right? Which mm -hmm. you know, to your credit, right. you're you're really going down that path and really trying right. hard. Right. Um, and you know, the the more aggregation we can do, the better. But more is better. I would say a minimum in any given some type of a thousand patients yeah. is really important. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. want to put some perspective around right. that because if we're talking just in lung cancer. Not, you know, you've got non-small cell, right. and under that you have adeno, and under adeno you've got ba 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 ba. Yeah. Then you've got squame, and then under squame you've got some subtypes. Then so you she go to just did it squame. It's squamous. Squamous. <laughs> Sorry, and then you, if you go to small cell, right. right, and then forget all the different type of endocrine, you know, cancers and the mesothelioma and all that. We are talking thousands of patients, and it's important because I'm really trying to drive this point home that 1,000 patients is not. That's not going to do it. It's not going to okay. do it. I mean, maybe on a small scale, you can get a little bit of information, but not to your point about, you know, the impact it's going to have in these, you, 25 patients, you know, that have one, that have similar markers or that are okay. squamous or whatever. Yeah. 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 yeah we have plenty of time. Yeah. Um, I, it, it's just sign up, people, is what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Sign yeah. Up, yeah. If you haven't signed sign up. up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All you people out there. Yeah. Um, we need a thermometer. Right. The number of people right. Yeah, right. We will. We will. We will. Um, so I want to um, pull up the registry and have everybody that hasn't had an opportunity to take a look um, be able to take a look. Oh, boy. You got my okay. Camera. We're watching. We're watching. So you can't see my password. This is on Zoom. Live demo is always stressful. Right. I know. And I can't see without my, it's my other thing without my glasses. And this is not going to be too extensive a demo, but Look this is... Look how cool that is. Um, cool. To, to um, what we were talking about a little bit earlier about it being non-branded, um, we created a completely separate logo, which I love, by the way. I wish it was our logo. I love it. Yeah. Um, um, with this really cool background, made it simple, easy to understand. Um, I think, I don't think... Where's the logos of the Scroll people down. that belong? No, they're right here. Sorry. Oh, there they are. Um, Boom. Yeah. So as you all know, the ALA and Lung Force are doing a, a fantastic job, and we are so honored and proud to be partnered with them on this on this project. We really believe that this is one of, I mean, everything we do we hope is having impact, but impact for different reasons. But when we're talking about scalability and the opportunity for immediate impact, and we think our community hospital program where we know 80% of the patients are seeing uh, this lung cancer registry in that it's it's pulling information globally uh, from patients. Um, and then, of course, the, the consortium and alchemy and, and um, the opportunity to, to run studies and, and gain access to information through that um, are huge. So we're really, really excited to be part of, uh, part of this with the ALA and anybody else, of course, who might be watching that wants to partner with us. Um, um, I don't, I'm not going to click on the, 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 the video right now, but we worked with a, a really great um, guy out of New York to really try to develop something that would explain up front um, what the purpose of the registry was and, and, um, um, and why it's so important. I think he did a fantastic job. But this is really what I wanna, I wanna show you. So this is your profile page that, that you would come to, right? This one, I created a profile and I entered all my, my mother's information. Um, but as a patient, this is what, this is what you would see. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, anecdote in the clinical trial um, uh, uh, option that's soon to be, and it, it will be here on this page as well. But this is the original survey, so it's you know what surveys have you taken right now? This is this is our baseline and where we started. So it'll you know she could click on it, or you as a patient could click on it and really look at sort of the answers you gave, what would, what maybe you haven't done yet, um, what you still need to fill in. Um, really, really, really easy to understand. Going back. Um, to the profile page, you can upload your healthcare providers, and this is where you could um, upload any of your files. So, um, you know, you've got your your CT scan reports, 
uh, your pathology report, so on and so forth, you, you can easily attach that right so there. I have a question. Do you have the ability to, um, when you get to the page where you, 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 you write in all your medications and your birth date and every other, mm -hmm. the survey, can you print it? Yes. So you go to another appointment, you just go in and print it. When they hand you the clipboard with 19 papers on it, you go, ah, they, They're probably not going to accept right it, but. They will. They will. They will. They will. They will. Uh, they like, everybody likes their own there it is. information or their own stuff. But here's the part that I think, um, as a patient, and you guys tell me, but as a patient, I, I think I might find most cool. So once you input your data, um, you can go to this view data profile, and it will compare what you've input to everybody else that has registered for the registry. So this is a map, and I can scroll out, and it'll show you uh, people from around the world who have thus far, and the further I go, you know, um, um, thus far signed up for the registry. So we've, we've got a decent amount of people from, from across the globe. Of, of course, we want more. Um, it'll give you your registered user information. Um, Here's where I'm going to start with symptoms, just because I think this is some of the stuff that kind of goes back into to your point earlier. You know, what were your symptoms? Um, you know, here you look, and it shows you how many people presented with or had these these different symptoms. Um, um, who did you initially see? You know, this is where we're trying to. One of the things we're looking at with some of our other programs is how far sort of upstream do we need to go from your medical oncologist? in order to yeah. ensure that you're getting yeah. the, an immediate diagnosis, yeah. right? I wish and so, was still here because, you know, they ask this question all the time. How many patients are coming through a pulmonary? Where are the patients mm -hmm. coming from? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's significant mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you receive treatment for something, you know, other than lung cancer? Or this is, you know, I think this is the how, um, how long did you have symptoms before you were diagnosed? And if you look at this, this is really important information because you know some people are out years, right? What is what is what does that mean, and what's going on? What's going on there? So, um, and then if we go into the diagnosis, how many adenos? How many squames? Small cell unsure. Again, it just compares you to you to who. And I don't know why the purple's not coming up here. So it's probably. It's a faint purple. Is it? Oh, can you see it up there? I can see it up there. Okay. Um, uh, molecular testing. Anyway, you kind of get the idea. There's not. There's really nothing on here that you answered that you can't look at what your answer was compared to everybody else's. And right now, we've got about about 200 people in the registry. Again, 200 people. But we haven't really launched it. No. Yet in a big way. So. Um, you know, and this is part of it. Tonight is part of it, and we have other things to do to, to make that happen. But that happened pretty quickly. The two hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to find. Sorry. Surgery, chemo. Here we go. So this this gets d deep down into the drugs people are on too, and the drugs they're on, and how they're responding. So we are able to to collect that. You know, how many people are are on a Tizo versus Nevo. These are immunotherapy drugs for those of you And this, this gets into what's, what's good for the patient in mm -hmm. here. You know, I mean, everything about this is good for the patient, mm -hmm. ultimately, in some form or fashion. But this is great for you to see. Uh, you know, you're on a new drug, and it's really good for you to see that that drug is, uh, other patients are responding really well to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that, that helps you put your head on the bed, on a pillow at night, and say, that's a good thing. And I think it's interesting to note here, and I, this, this right here just is what kind of made me think of it. And we talk about this internally, and we, we just touched a little bit, these unreachable. The, the, the patients who tend to interact, whether it's in a living room um, or at an event or in something like a registry, tend to be the ones that have a targeted therapy, um, or have had a targeted therapy in the past that are on an immunotherapy. Um, and it's, we're really trying to figure out why, right? Yeah, they have more hope. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with chemotherapy, right? But this is a really good indicator of, you know, did you test positive for mutation? Well, 109, right, out of the 129 people that answered this question, Tested positive, and I just think it's it's it'll be really interesting as we as we kind of go down and look at this. And here we go again. We're not just asking for EGFR, ALK, and ROS1. The 
the, the drugs that, or the targets that we know have uh, approved drugs for, but we're asking for um, um, others that are known to lungs. And, and this is amazing to me, right? I mean, you're asking mutations here. Right. Yeah. And, and right. the fact that patients know enough Absolutely. Mm -hmm. to do that Absolutely. 10 years ago Absolutely. didn't exist. And I go to peri yeah. patient conferences and they right. wear badges mm -hmm. Absolutely. with their mm -hmm. mutation on their badge. Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Um, uh, oh, shoot. What the way the saying? questions are, are, are listed, too, and I think this is another thing that I love. Sorry, I, I want you to find your thought. Um, is it, the patient doesn't have to be the one filling out this survey. As a caregiver, you can fill it out on behalf. As a, you know, as a family member, as a friend, um, you can fill it out, of course, with the, the, the patient's permission, and the, the opt-in levels are a little bit different, but go ahead. And you know, you mentioned caregiver, and, and the, you know, one of the things that we can do is, you know, this is kind of the initial intake questionnaire, if you will, but as we get more people in here and we start learning more and more, then we can start digging deeper, right? Mm -hmm. So you could say for people that are on this drug or that drug, or if the caregiver entered that data on behalf of somebody, maybe we could do a caregiver questionnaire, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And let's, let's understand mm -hmm. what the impact is on the entire family mm -hmm. and caregivers, I, mm -hmm. as opposed to the patient, because it's a broader thing. Absolutely. You know, families get this. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I, I thought, my, my thought came back. Um, we, could, we could actually develop information and find, find information about what line is best right now with immunotherapy? We don't know if it's best used first line pure, right. you know, completely free of any other type of medication, or second line or third line. That's right. So that's going to be amazing in and of itself, and that we're going to be able to get information on fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lines right? of therapy is, yeah. is yeah. a mm -hmm. big question. Right, for. and especially because immunotherapy is, you know, like the great hope right now, one of the great hopes. Um, you know, it's going to be really interesting to compare people that have never been on anything else and are entering into the immuno in immunotherapy mm -hmm. world later. And I think um, for, for those of you who maybe haven't uh, registered, it's so easy. I think, you know, depending upon how quick a reader you are, you know, I've had, you know, some patients say this takes them 10 or 15 minutes and other people, it's easy. it takes, you know, it's maybe really maybe 15 or 20, but they're mainly, mul mostly multiple choice questions. There's, you don't have to answer every question in it. Depending upon your previous answer, it's going to skip you to something, you know, relevant to how you answered it. So it's really, um, it really does not, does not take that long. And I hope, um, I hope that we've been able to express how important um, this type of information is um, now and moving forward. Yeah, it's critical. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions based on this really quick kind of run through? We're getting short on time or anything anybody wants to see in this space or Kyle, anything or Jan, anything you think I should? I, I do think out? over time, I mean, but, you know, <clears throat> I mentioned the Corey thing, but one of the things that they're really big on is asking the patient community mm -hmm. what, what Pay, what information is important to them right. mm -hmm. to collect, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. So I would suggest yeah. anyone watching, you know, if right. you have suggestions on types of information that we to should improve. consider Absolutely. collecting, yeah. you know, yeah. we should hear it. Absolutely. Your yeah. blood type. Right. Real yeah. big on blood type, blood eye color. Yeah. I mean, to me, that just seems like a no brainer, mm -hmm. right? Because our blood type is very unique mm -hmm. to us. Well, uh, and we, we say here all the time, you know, God bless these, the, the scientists and the docs and the researchers who have been out there doing this for so long, but it's almost like they've been doing it for so long. In a lot of cases, common sense, right, and sort of just rational thought gets thrown out the window because they get so focused in this in this sort of scientific yeah. process, right? Well, and some researchers, you know, they're focused on, you know, this gene. Mm -hmm. And they're in a lab, and they don't well, deal with patients necessarily. And, and quite so getting that input's huge. They're yes. working under a protocol. That's right. And they have to do everything in the protocol, and they can't go outside the protocol. So no. they're like, once the protocol is written, they're like and the, tunnel vision. Yeah, and this isn't just beneficial for purposes of, you know, new, new treatment options, but also, you know, side effects. Quite often, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, patients have to go off drugs right. because they can't tolerate the side effects. So right. if we can determine what those side effects are, right, and then work with industry to try to combat those, and we've come a long way, right, with, with, with treatments for, for to kind of, you know, right. address some of the side effects, but, you know, not, not far enough to where somebody can receive some of these treatments and just go about life 
right. you know, 24 seven. Well, so. and that's the beauty exactly. about patient sharing too, because you can see what other people are dealing with in side effects and maybe even find out what they're taking, how they finally got to a point where they got it got it under under control yeah. mm -hmm. and it might be something natural it might be something that's not mm -hmm. a drug you know mm -hmm. and th those are that's beneficial information but also you know we talk here all the time about why are the docs not looking for lung cancer and I touched on this about how far upstream do you have to go to give to educate people so that they are looking for it right and when we we and Michelle can tell you too we talk to people constantly that are you know, 6, 12, 18 months from first symptom to diagnosis. Well, a year and a half right. to diagnose someone with lung cancer is way too long. Absolutely. So if we can use this data to then, you know, pull and then go back out upstream, you know, right. maybe, maybe, not maybe, people would listen. Leah, you've sure. had your hand on the mic and I forgot, sorry. Hi everybody, I'm Leah Fine. I work at the foundation and I run the Centers of Excellence program. And I wanted to build on a question that Danielle had asked earlier. She had asked about, you know, at what point, you know, how many numbers do you need to make it statistically significant and meaningful? But then the follow-on question to that is, at what point does it become believable and actionable to the physician and clinician communities such that, you know, they rely on that registry data and information to actually make clinical decisions. It's, you know, from my understanding, the clinicians and the physicians are a very conservative group. They want to see something go through, you know, the whole FDA approval process. But at what point do you see a tipping point, so to speak, such that, you know, the clinicians will feel comfortable acting on information and context provided in the registries? That's a really good question and an important point. Um, how we've seen um, some advocacy groups um, actually use this data is to, to put together care considerations, they call them, right, or standards of care, mm -hmm. um, and work with the medical community to come up with what is the new standard of care mm -hmm. for treatment. And, you know, I think in this instance, I think it's kind of interesting because it, you are in the rural settings, it, and I think standards of care is probably going to become more and more critical. but. I'm not sure that those are generally done um, with a lot of patient reported information as a contributor. I, I think that a lot of times it's more about, you know, well, we just use this med and this first line, this second line, and this is just mm. the way you do it. This is what the NCCN guidelines mm -hmm. say. Right. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, we've seen this in muscular dystrophy in particular, right? And I keep using that as an example because they've done yeah. a really nice job. Sure. And they've used this data to actually create care considerations and push mm -hmm. those out. Mm -hmm. And now you can use the data that you're collecting to actually do education of the physician community, yeah. right? Even well, do continuing medical education and, credits. And how about the FDA? Why not? Well, that's huge. Right? Well, and the FDA yeah. now is more and more requiring patient input. Right. And which is great. I love to that. It. Absolutely. They, you know, yeah. they haven't quite defined exactly what that means. Right. But right. I think that, you know, by virtue of you guys doing this, I think you're right. just gonna be that much further ahead. Oh well, yeah, Absolutely. and the NCCN yeah. too. I mean, you know, yeah. they're they're the ones sort yeah. of, you know, first line, sort second of, line, third they're line, telling boom, boom, the docs yeah. how to treat the patient. Yeah. And so Sally, you have a question? Yeah, I do. When Ganit was talking before and with what was being said about, you know, maybe something that's working in the melanoma group would work for lung cancer. And my question is, what about the insurance companies or the standard of care saying, yeah, we'll pay for that or we'll allow you to use that for lung cancer when typically it's only been used, I'm just saying melanoma, but because mm -hmm. that was mentioned. But, so that's what concerns me is what the crossover is going to be and what's going to be allowed and isn't going to be allowed. Well, that, I think that's why the data is so important because so, ma so much of the information is subjective. You know, um, I mean, and this is proof that, you know, once once you have more data in here that um, they can, they can, help them, and this could actually be, I think, uh, a big, useful tool to them. Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity to collect what they call sort of end of one data, right? So right. what did your treatment look like, or what did Charlie's treatment look like, right? So um, I'll give an example. So 13 years ago, 
when you had your surgery, it was a rarely, if ever, done before surgery because of the cardiac involvement, right? Well, now it's done routinely. So maybe that would have happened more quickly if through something like a registry, we could have shown her data against other people's data, right? We're, we're like, oh, surgery's never ever done on stage four patients. Not well, resectable. Right, but we, we have these patients that we talk to all the time that are having these sort of outside of the box treatments that are working. So if we can collect their information and then start mining them and comparing this data, we can then go back right. and say, it, either maybe somebody should look at this and do a study on it, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe patient X, you know, we've seen this, you can go back to your doctor and discuss and it, it as an And it option. could certainly lead to better clinical trials as well. Sure. Because very more often, more, yeah, yeah. you know, more likely to work, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Because yeah. of the hypothesis we already going have, in right. mm -hmm. has way more yeah. likelihood yeah. of becoming true, right? Right. Exactly. If, you, if you have these sort of controlled sort of yeah. But yeah. but you know, Sally, Sally, right? Uh, you, you know, I think the point is really important that that you, you know, a, a researcher I worked with years and years ago, he said it's not the piece of paper that's sitting on your desk in front of you that you're looking for; it's the one next to you, but you just don't know it. And that, to me, is very similar to the type of information that we're collecting across many different cancers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the answer is going to come in looking across many different cancers. Yeah. And if there are treatments in other cancers, you, you know, pharmaceutical companies love that because it's... They sell more you, drugs. You, yeah, you know, rightly or wrongly, do. they're for profit, right? And, and they can get that drug approved much faster right. because it's already showed efficacy and, and safety in another disease so they can they can apply it to this other disease much more quickly right and I think that's really important mm -hmm. um, huge. in in these types of, yeah. of situations yep I just wanted to add to this Sally that you know increasingly cancer is being treated more as uh, more on the basis of the actual oncogenic driver like ROS1 driven cancer EGFR driven cancer and lesser and lesser as lung cancer or melanoma or GBM, et cetera, right? And we are, you know, it's slow, but it is happening that insurance is cap catching up also, and they are willing to uh, fund. Not all of them, not everywhere, not yet, but we are getting there, you know, for several immunotherapy drugs. Now, pharma also wants to run what they call basket trials, which are focused on the oncogenic driver, the actual alteration, and not the tumor type, not the anatomic tissue of origin, but the actual driver. And you know, this way everybody benefits. The patients benefit, pharma companies obviously benefit like Kyle mentioned. And then insurance also benefits because you know, um, patients get lesser procedures, et cetera, because they are responding to treatment that is specifically targeted to their, uh, their cancer, right? Does that kind of answer your question? Sure. Anybody else have questions in the room? Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah. Um one of the challenges about the clinical trials, um, well, I'm going to Stanford now, and I try to ask about clinical trials at UCSF, and there's a disconnect there. And um, seeing you have this idea for patient registries, uh, I was thinking, like, well, what if we have a clinical trial registry for especially places like Stanford and UCSF, they should be able to know what's going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe all these centers they are know. excellent. <laughs> and they know what's going and on. And we may have touched on this before you came in, Charlie, but we do have a tool and a group that we've partnered with that's doing a really good job at this. And so it will be available. It's currently, you can find it on our patient portal on the website, but it's going to attach um, to, the, to the registry as well where the hope is that it'll be able to autofill some of the questions it's going to ask so you don't have to answer so many questions right up front. Um, but when you click on it, you know, within a series of probably four to five questions, you, the patient, will be able to have information about clinical trials relevant to your cancer um, in your area. So you could then go back and discuss it with your doctor and or contact the clinical, site, uh, clinical trial site directly. But, but I think it's important, right? Because, I, you know, if, the, if you can come armed mm -hmm. to Stanford with, you know, look, I know there's a UCSF study going on, and, it, and I believe I'm, I'm qualified for that. You know, just because he's not an investigator on that study is no reason why he shouldn't refer you to them. 
Um, so I think you know the more information that, that you all have is is only going to help. Mm -hmm. um, clinical trials is a is a, a big piece of it, mm -hmm. um, but but certainly they're aware of the different trials. Um, but but I believe that by uh, uh, yourself walking in with armed with some information that this other trial is available, it's only going to help. Yeah, and we talk about this all the time. You know, the unfortunate reality about even medicine is that it's a business, right? And and people need to make money and they need to put food on their tables. And sending you or anybody else to a different hospital is taking money away from their hospital. And that's that's sort of this, not in all cases, but it's the sad truth in a lot of cases, which is why it's business and which is unfortunate, but it's why we so heavily recommend educating and advocating for yourself because sometimes you have to be the one to do it. Well, and you, you know that we advocate for the shared uh, voice between you and your physician. So you go in armed with information mm -hmm. and you then say to them, well, explain to me what is the difference between the, the trial you're offering me and the trial here, here, and here? Mm -hmm. You know, and why is this one mm -hmm. the best for me? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, I think patients are happier and physicians should be happier as well mm -hmm. that you're in agreement that this is the right thing for you. And if it's not, then you have options to, you know, make it right. Right. Andrea, anybody online? We good? So um, at this point, I want to, well, A, give a huge thank you to Kyle for coming out and, and um, A, um, working with us um, on building what we believe is an, uh, is an amazing registry and going to do amazing things. Um, Jan, who um, is sitting over here on the couch. She's shy. Um, she is shy. <laughs> um, she, 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 she sat with me weekly for the better part of a year um, in order to create and develop and refine uh, this registry. And so I, I can't thank you both enough because I think together um, we're going to be doing We have really, the easy job. Really I mean, amazing I mean, the things. video, and I'll never forgive you for making me cry. I yeah. But, <laughs> but, you know, you guys do the hard work. And, thanks. you know, you guys deserve all the thanks because you don't have to do this. Thanks, Kyle. And, and that's, you know, it's but a we big deal. We care. We it's really a big do. Deal. We really care. Yeah. We don't like the beach that much anyway. Yeah. No, um, forget the beat. Um, and I want to turn it to Katie for a second, to get because I know we're getting short on time, I, um, to give a couple of updates on upcoming events for those in the room and or online that might um, be interested. Good evening, everybody. My name is Katie Wilcox. I work for the foundation, and um, I'm on the events team. I wanted to give a big shout out. On, on your way out, please uh, give a big thank you to the Sarah High School students that are here tonight volunteering their time. They've been folding shirts and doing little tasks uh, throughout the night, but um, they're cutting cake now for everybody to have after this. So big thank you to the Sarah High School students for coming. Also a big shout out, we have our endurance program and this past weekend we had uh, five people participate in our New York Half Marathon and they raised over $11,000, which is awesome. And we have people, we had a patient, we had caregivers, um, so that was an amazing team. We sent a staff member out there and got to bring them all together, and it was a wonderful event. So um, speaking on, on endurance, we have a, a handful of bibs left. We actually just filled all of our spots for the full marathon for New York, um, but we do have one bib left for a run in Berlin. So if anybody wants to go to Berlin and run and raise funds for the lung cancer, you can certainly do so. Um, and then we have some other spots for a, a run happening in Hillsburg and a Tinkerbell Marathon. So if anybody's like a diehard Disney person and they want to run in the Tinkerbell, we have spots for that. Um, or if you know somebody that's interested, send them our way. In terms of the 5Ks that we have coming up, um, we have Sacramento next. We have Dallas. I'm just going to mention the three that are coming up most closest. So Sacramento, Dallas, and then Chicago. So those are the ones coming up on the 5K end. Um, and Michelle, you'll probably speak to the living room happening on Thursday. A little shout out. Oh. And you can mention that, but then she and then Jen right is now. Jen is aggressively planning for the That's golf it. tournament. Um, people are starting to sign up. So if anybody's a golfer and you want to get involved with that, golf and gala are happening this year, and she's starting the planning around all of that. 
Um, and then grassroots, if you have your own event, own idea, you want to come to us and run with it, we'll help support that. That can be anything from a car show to a benefit concert. Um, we'll help create flyers with you and we'll be there right alongside you every step of the way. So let us know what you want to do and we'll support it. Michelle's so mad at you right now for making her. Well, I was thinking events, and I'm like. No, I love her. <laughs> okay, so Thursday, March 23rd, we are having a first remote living room in Sacramento. If you want to travel two hours, we are having it downtown. It's on our website, and it's one of many. We will be going to other states soon. Yeah. Or if we're in Sacramento, or are around yes, in the Sacramento, Sacramento. area, yeah. Tahoe. That mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Come on anyway, no, we're really excited about this opportunity to take what we do here sort of on the road. So we're planning on doing four of them this, this year. Um, um, yeah, we're not, we're, we're not going to be live streaming them, um, although uh, we may be doing YouTube, YouTube. I don't really know how we're going to work that out. We're still, we're, Sacramento, we keep telling um, all the amazing docs that are coming to talk, this is our sort of pilot. So this is our trial and error um, one. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Michelle um, and Sam. Yeah, we're Facebook living it. That's what I meant. And you two being it weird. Yeah. 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 Sam at the events team, Katie, and I think Gina and, and Michelle and Sam went up and they found a great location to have it. We've been doing some amazing outreach in the Sacramento area with the, with the events team um, to really give other people sort of the opportunity to sit around the room like we all do and have a have a have a face to face. So um, uh, we've got it's a it's a panel discussion. Um, talking about living with lung cancer, so it's going to be great. We're excited. Did you have? But, but you can all dial in. You can all, mm -hmm. you, nope. you know, get the benefit. You can't, no, you the, can't dial you can't in. Dial in. You can watch it afterwards. Yeah, you can watch it afterwards. Oh. Um, we're doing. The, we're doing Facebook the other. Yeah, face. Facebook you can. Live. You can watch it on Facebook Live. We'll okay. send out the links. Michelle will send it out to the patient group, like she always does. Um, um, the other cities we're doing it in are uh, Miami, Florida. Um, in or Philadelphia and Spartanburg, South Carolina. So um, that's where that's where we we will be having our our next three. Quick change of topic. I totally forgot. This was like the first thing I wanted to mention, but. We try to get sponsorships for our 5K series, our endurance program, all that stuff. And sponsorship starts at two hundred and fifty dollars, and then goes to the ceiling plus some. Um, we found that sometimes that's a big ask for local small businesses. So we've recently incorporated something called a business card sponsorship. So if you're a participant of any of our events, you know any local businesses, maybe it's a hair salon, your oil shop, where you get your tires, whatever, um, $100 donation plus get their business card and we'll put their business card in the program so it's a nice way to recognize them and and show support to that local business and it's a, at an amount that almost everybody can participate at so business card sponsorship if you're interested thanks katie um uh, the next next month's living room is a patient round table so it's dedicated exclusively to patients we're gonna sit around and have um real big Living with lung cancer. About living with lung cancer from a patient perspective. So um, really learning from one another. Those of you who, who are veterans here um, know, what, know what they're about. So we're, we're excited to do, to do that next month. Um, I want to, again, thank Kyle and Invite uh, for helping to build this, this amazing registry and for coming to speak to us tonight. Big, sure. big round thrilled. of applause for Kyle. Thank you. Um, I want, to th I want to thank again um, the American Lung Association and Lung Force for joining forces with us um, in, in helping to uh, get patients on board and um, really creating a, a, a robust registry. Thank you, Ganit, for your valuable input tonight. Um, thank you, obviously, to Peninsula Television. Um, I cannot tell you how hard they work in order to set all of this up and get it done. Um, I, we, we absolutely could not do this without you guys. So thank you, thank you. Thank you again to the Office Bar and Grill uh, for spaghetti night and chicken, um, um, chicken salad. It was delicious, I think. Huh? Pesto night. Oh, it was pesto night? Great, so we have pesto. Um, thank you to our, to our, our, our sponsors and, and supporters, those, those folks out there who, without their support, we could not bring this um, to you. Estellas, Bristol Myers Squibb, Celgene, Genentech, Lily Merck, Novartis, uh, Yahoo Employee Foundation. It's, um, it's so 
so, so much appreciated by us at the foundation and by patients all over. Mom, I don't know if you want to say anything before we close out. Uh, just that I am, you know, super proud. You know, from, from the moment we started both of these foundations, it's been meeting one unmet need after another. We had no idea. The original hope was to have a gala and maybe a golf tournament, raise a ton of money and give it all to UCSF. Grateful patient, you know, we always want to do something for the people that helped us. But um, this, is, this is probably the biggest unmet need that, that we've tackled uh, in the last mm -hmm. 10 plus years. But the one I think that we're gonna be, you know, very, very proud of because it has the ability to affect millions of patients, not just a couple hundred or, you know, a, a lot, mm -hmm. and it's exciting. I'm very proud and very excited about this whole thing, so thank awesome. you. Thank you. And thank all of you, and thank all of the people yeah, online. I wanna, for... I wanna, yeah, my, my, my final thank you is to the patients and the caregivers and families and friends of patient, patients out there. Um, your voice is so needed, um, and we hear you. Uh, we want everybody else to hear you, so please, 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 um, uh, help us help you sign up for the registry, uh, www.lungcancerregistry.org, O-R-G. Um, come, on, come on over and, and sign up and, and become part of the solution with us. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, we will see you next month. Clap. No? Like There's cake. Sign. There's oh, yeah, cake. come get cake. Sally brought cake.